the real story that needs to be told here is, you know, how these pharmaceutical companies, you know, they produce all these pills, you know what I mean? And they flood the market with them. Look, all those guys, the pharmaceutical companies, the doctors, the people selling it, they're all drug dealers. That's the bottom line, they're all drug dealers. It's all about money. And for Big Pharma, money is good. The senior executives of pharmaceutical giant GlaxoSmithKline at a pep rally in Las Vegas for their sales team. There are people in this room who are going to make an ungodly sum of money. Who wants to be a millionaire? In the past 10 years, the 11 largest drug companies made $711 billion. $711 billion? If we were looking for a bad guy, sounds like we may have found our man. The pharmaceutical industry remains the most profitable business in the U.S. More success and financial gain for the companies will always remain possible as long as more Americans are encouraged to take drugs. Pharmaceuticals have always been around, from the apothecary of the Middle Ages to the snake oil salesman of the Wild West. All he wants is a miracle, folks. How can I deny him? If he's willing to pay for it! He's gonna get it. There have always been sellers of potions and tinctures with the promise of miracle cures and remedies. And most of them were far from helpful. So to protect us from these scam artists and charlatans, we created agencies like the FDA and required pharmaceutical companies to work under strict regulations. But that cut into their ability to make drugs for profit. And that's not American. Those regulations were getting in the way of big business. And pharma needed a hero. Enter everyone's favorite president and big business poster child, Ronald Reagan. The only way to stop abusing them is to stop using them. While Nancy Reagan was waging her war on drugs, Ronnie and his administration were lifting a moratorium on advertising to consumers. You know, for freedom. Big Pharma was born. Drug companies were now ready to take on the American public. And Reagan had given them access to the big guns, direct to consumer marketing. And in 1997, everyone's favorite saxophone wielding president, Bill Clinton, and his administration loosened up the regulations even further, making us one of only two countries in the entire world that think that advertising to consumers is a good idea. I, mean, I have to say, this was the advertising and marketing coup of the century. You couldn't do that before. This is my friend, Dr. Gerber. In 1997, he became the first person in the United States to receive a PhD in homeopathy. I mean, the fact that you can, you can present a problem to an audience as big as a TV audience and say, ask your doctor if such and such is right for you. Wow, I'll ask my doctor. So I go to my doctor. Lo and behold, because the rep from the company was just there with a truckload of samples, he goes, well, gee, let's see. He opens up the drawer, gives the person like a month's worth of samples, just they're free. And then there goes the prescription writing, and then that's it for forever. So I get it. You give them the first taste for free, and then they're hooked. We tried to talk to a bunch of people from various pharma companies, but they didn't seem to want anything to do with us. So I talked to Gwen Olson. She was a pharma rep for 15 years and wrote the book, Confessions of an Rx Drug Pusher. I knew at some point that was what my job was. I was a drug pusher. I was just doing it legally and with the, you know, being condoned by society. And when people would say, you know, well, you sell drugs, and I would always say, oh, yes, ethical, pharmaceuticals, as if. I've never seen a commercial for Oxycontin. I've never seen one for Vicodin. And... They don't need them. The drugs sell themselves. So why do they advertise the other type of drugs? Because they have to get the consumer to believe that they need them. Hey, Pete. Yeah, it's me, big brother. Put the remote down and listen. This intervention brought to you by Niaspan. So you cut back on the cheeseburgers and stop using your exercise bike as a coat rack. That's it. You're done? I don't think so. If there was a panacea that came onto the market tomorrow, do you believe that they'd have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars in advertising on primetime TV for the rest of the world to know about it? A new word of mouth. People would know about it in a heartbeat. Women who take Lipitor or the other statin drugs for cholesterol have approaching a 50% greater chance of developing diabetes, according to this study. Well, what about all these statin drugs? Like, they're, they're, you know, saving people's lives. We need statin drugs. Statin drugs are one of the biggest, um, I, I call it a big fat lie because that's what the cholesterol lie is. The sickest people I've ever seen in my 32 years of practice were people whose cholesterol was too low. Without enough cholesterol in your system, your immune system can't work properly. All of the long-term data on the statins show that you will die sooner if your cholesterol is lower, particularly if you're over 55, if you're female or male. There is no benefit to the drugs. I'm not saying that there aren't some individuals who should monitor their cholesterol because of the risk factor, correct? There are other means of lowering cholesterol besides taking the toxic drugs that the statins are. This is a very ingenious marketing plan. 
What is one of the major side effects of cholesterol-lowering drugs? Do you happen to know? Impotence. Impotence is one of the things that's complained about most frequently for men that are on cholesterol drugs. Well, guess what the same manufacturer's number two selling drug is that makes Lipitor? Viagra. Viagra, hey! Now we've got a patient population that we can sell our next drug to. Every time I take something, I always feel weird. And then somebody will say, a doctor will say, well, for the weirdness you're feeling by taking something, take something else. And the next thing you know, I'm taking nine things. Okay, okay, you're going to wind up like Anna Nicole Smith. Like, there was a point in time when I had my hip surgery. I just got so conditioned to, like, taking a pill that when the next thing came up, like, oh, these painkillers are causing me anxiety, so then I need the Xanax, and then, you know, I can't sleep, so you need the Ambien. Right. And you can't focus, so you need the Adderall. And then, like, I, I was, I had, I had, like, probably 10 prescription bottles, you know, in my cabinet. That's causing this problem, so take this, and that's causing this problem, so take this. And then, before you know it, you do have 10 prescription bottles on your, it causes one problem. Why take it if you don't need it, you know? A lot of people have this misconception that the pharmaceutical industry is altruistic and they're philanthropists and that they're, you know, looking to heal the world. There couldn't be anything further from the truth. The pharmaceutical industry is, their, their vested interest is in making their stockholders money. Because the pharmaceutical industry isn't in the business of health and healing. It's in the business of disease management and symptoms maintenance. Big Pharma has a has a economic incentive to classify things so that they can create pills for them, right? Do you know what restless leg syndrome was? I didn't. <laughs> either, either did I. I'm, I'm so sorry! <laughs> You know, they're sitting there because they've drank six cups of coffee today and they've got all these re refined carbohydrates and sugars running through their body and they're looking down and going, yeah, that's what I've got. Restless leg syndrome. Let me go get a prescription for that. And I mean, there the indoctrination goes right in. 75% of the time, statistics say that if they go in and request a drug, the doctor will give it to them because the doctor considers it his business and they are his customer. That's the problem with, with the advertising, the, the big pharma advertising campaign. What they tell you is, Whatever your symptom is, we've got a pill for it, okay? Mm -hmm. But that's not the way the world works, okay? You actually have to be a human being and feel your feelings. If your brother dies, okay, you can expect to feel sad. Feeling your feelings is hard, but lucky for us, Big Pharma has a solution, psych meds. Finally, we have the perfect pill that promises to take away all of our bad feelings and replace them with sunshine and little happy trees. In 2001, the first Zoloft ads hit the airwaves, and we finally discovered that we were suffering from depression. America had a sickness, and depression was its name. Suddenly, the market was flooded with a tsunami of new psych meds. Now, one in every ten Americans are on antidepressants, including our dogs. You heard it right, Doggy Prozac, a beef-flavored version of the well-known human antidepressant. Because the pharmaceutical industry isn't in the business of health and healing. It's in the business of disease management and symptoms maintenance.